What I'm going to do tonight is just go through the bits of West Connect stage by stage using the maps that are on the West Connect's website. We want to try and um, see what it is that they're proposing to do. It's been very difficult, all of this process, because we've not been given a very clear and definitive definition of what it is that they're actually proposing to build. It's been released in dribs and drabs, and that's um, been a cause for some uh, confusion and concern. The other reason why is because it's important for us all to understand the big picture and what that strategic big picture is so that we can see how it is that our small um, local area fits within that big picture. It's the big picture that provides the justification for something like this. And the point is that if the big picture can't be justified, then a lot of this should not be should not be taking place. Okay, so that's the, the rationale for what I'm um, going to do. So, here, this is stage one, um, or the, the M4. So basically what we know about the M4 is that there's, um, it's been, the existing section is being widened through here, um, and then there is an extension going on through there. So we'll just go to the next slide, Andrew, yep. Um, so what we're seeing is, extensions, um, additional lanes on, on the existing section of motorway. And the outcome from this is that it will induce traffic growth, potentially. So the act of increasing the capacity here will generate further traffic growth. So in previous presentations, some of you have seen um, the data that I've presented on the before and after conditions that occurred when previous sections of the M5 were built. And what happened as a result of that was that there was more traffic in the network generally, not just on these specific roads, but on the other on other roads and some of them quite far afield. So that is the uh, the outcome that you get when you reduce the amount of congestion. Uh, it then attracts more traffic onto that network. So this is what would happen here, and this is where um, this this is an interesting point. So if you really were trying to manage traffic better than what you currently are, you wouldn't widen this existing section. You wouldn't go and make a road that is pointed at a very heavily congested area of the city, the CBD and the inner, um, the inner west. You wouldn't go and induce more traffic into that. So at the moment we get a very big bottleneck here and the raison d'etre is that, well, if we then extend, um, if we then extend the motorway, with these additional lanes up here, uh, then we'll take some of this off here and we'll shift it over to there. All right, that's the, the rationale. There's also some very, very elaborate construction going on here, which um, is quite extraordinary. All right, this is the next one. This is another one. Um, so what typically happens in points like this is that the induced traffic growth or the additional traffic that is attracted onto this network usually means that we get big increases in traffic on the feeder routes. Now one of the things that's important about motorways is to make sure, well, if you're wanting to build them, is to make sure that your feeder routes have sufficient capacity to support the additional um, volumes that you're going to get on the main trunk route. Um, so when you don't do that, you end up with cross-city tunnels where the tunnel doesn't have very much traffic in it. And the reason why is because there is a bottleneck on the feeder route on the eastern side. And that bottleneck stops or puts a ceiling on the amount of traffic that can get into that tunnel here. Uh, with the expansion of all of these um, feeder routes, you, you then don't end up with that situation. But you end up with more traffic on the network generally. And you end up with bigger roads with higher volumes of traffic on it. And there are then questions that people would ask about whether that is good for your city general. All right, what have we got here? Ah, this, okay. Um, there's two things going on here. So at some point, the traffic has to come out of the motorway. So this is some of the sections that are then going to push this additional, the, the traffic up onto Parramatta Road. So it comes out at this point. So what I think will happen here is that the types of conditions that we currently see around Strathfield will be shifted to this point here. This will be an outcome. Um, and I, um, 
questions could be asked, and I think should be asked, about whether that is a good outcome. Um, <laughs> the motorway then goes into, um, you've got tunnel sections that then go up through here. Okay. Yes, this is the next one, right. So here they are. Um, the tunnels are coming through here. It's pushing traffic onto um, the city west link, and then it goes into Anzac Bridge. Now, Anzac Bridge has been operating at capacity, at a ceiling capacity, for um, a very long time. So, under this configuration, what stage one does is three things. It induces more traffic growth, so there's more traffic coming in on a lot of the feeder routes. It takes um, the, the uh, bottleneck from Strathfield and shifts it to there, so you get a similar outcome there. And then it's also enabling traffic to go into um, a system that is already at capacity, so it's, it's not got much, it, it hasn't got anywhere really to go. So if we go back to the point, why would you expand that earlier point, that the, earlier, um, the earlier sections of the M4? these bits up here. The, the raison d'etre, or the, the strategic reason of that, I think, is that you would want to, some people would want to put a toll back on this motorway, and the reason why is because it's one of the most um, financially viable motorways within the city network. There's a lot of traffic on it. If you toll it, you've got a large revenue flow. Uh, the construction cost for simply widening sections of the M4 is not very much, so I think that explains some of that. What I think happens here is that there is an obvious tension between wanting to construct things and wanting to solve transport problems. So a lot of what's being constructed, a lot of what's being constructed is not really solving Sydney's transport problems. It is providing some very large um, construction jobs for industry. Um, okay, the M5. So we have similar situations down here. The M5 is, is, I find the M5 intriguing, especially the sections up through here, uh, which we'll get to in a moment. So once again, we're seeing an expansion here that um, should lead to induced traffic growth. Uh, this is also a very heavily um, trafficked route now, as uh, Peter Jones said earlier. Uh, what I, I'm, I was a bit shocked at when I looked at them in more uh, detail, is when we start looking at all of this, so let's go to the next slide, here we go. Um, a lot of these, these sections, they just end. Um, <laughs> they just end in, in nowhere. Um, so it's, it's a very elaborate piece of construction now, all right. That's being done in order to preempt or um, to queue further construction. Um, but the problem here is this is the, the cross city tunnel dilemma. And so if we just build what they have told everybody in the community about, it, about at the moment, we end up with a bit of a cross city tunnel scenario in these new sections. Um, unless, unless, you start dramatically widening a lot of the other feeder routes up through here. Now, I think the announcement was made yesterday that they're talking about widening Euston Road. Um, I'm not sure if Gardners was included in that, but there were a lot of other roads within this area. Now, the problem with the M5 under this current configuration is that it's basically going to fill what was described as Sydney's densest, or in, 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 emergently, um, it's Sydney's densest suburb. So that's going to be filled with a lot more road traffic. Now, in the, in the way I've been taught, um, and the way I research on integrated transport and land use um, planning and systems, is that when you have very dense suburbs, you can't service them well with a low capacity transport network, which is what road networks are. They're very low capacity. You have to put mass transit in. And I'm not seeing a comprehensive mass transit network plan for this area here. So I'm deeply concerned. Um, let's go on to the next one. Um, yeah, the, these are these other sections. Oh yeah, that's, this is another set of off-ramps. So um, West Botany Street and, oh yes, 
This is where the traffic currently comes out on, onto Marsh Street, where, or where um, a section, a portion of the M5 ends. So these areas are all going to, in the longer term, if um, these motorways are built, they, they will become, uh, I think, more congested and have, they will end up with more traffic on them. Right, this is, yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, maybe at the next one, Andrew. Push the button again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's go back to this one. All right, so what, what's going on here? What's the, the rationale? So if you want to build this to there, you wouldn't do just that. Um, and what I think is going on here is that they're trying to... Uh, this here is a bottleneck as well. So what they're trying to do is look for a way in which to build another freeway up through here. All right? This is the M6, um, and a lot of traffic coming up through here is currently going up through um, the Eastern Distributor. If you were to build that, then you would free up some of the capacity through here that the M5 uses, um, so that the indu any induced traffic that you create through that can then go up through here. But you then have a lot of induced traffic going up through this section here. So, um, what? Mm, so, with this, this is where it gets very complicated through here, and clearly they haven't worked it all out. Um, but what were, the end game? The end game is that we end up with, um, in the short term, a cross city tunnel scenario here with some more congestion in some parts, I guess the, the view would be that that then preempts the need for more motorway development through here. Um, you are then able to free up capacity here by shifting some of the traffic that would go there over to there, but you're then also creating more traffic through that um, through that access there, and you're inducing a whole lot of demand up through there that you don't currently have to the same degree. So you end up with, um, and this would fill to um, capacity again very quickly, so you end up with a very highly trafficked trunk route there and there, and then there's a lot of feeder routes in amongst here that are very highly um, congested within the, within Sydney's dense, most densest suburbs, and this is also economically very important. So, the, but generally speaking, this is just not what you would do. I'm reminded of what the outcomes were when the last link in the M25 was built, and this is what then gives rise to um, the advent of what we call super jams, which are very common in London now. So these are traffic jams that can last for four, five, six, eight hours. Uh, well over 60 kilometres, all the way down from Waterfall in a continuous, uninterrupted, no traffic light to men uh, seated the Prime Minister and the Premier so that they'll be able to get to the airport, to the Sydney University, to Parramatta and to Canberra without passing a single traffic light. Now, <clears throat> Mr Cliché, who's the CEO of uh, the Sydney Motorway Corporation, said uh, it is an objective of the um, of the West Connex to improve the connections from the North Shell to the airport and to Sydney University and to Parramatta. Um, they're not really talking about it in terms of the Western suburbs. But if we go forward, um, this is the inner monstrosity. Uh, they just announced the widening through E. Uh, when they released the EIS, they just did the traffic modelling to 100 metres up Euston Road, or about 500. Yep. And then they said that that had been modelled, even though we knew there was a road widening, even though we knew it was going to come. And then uh, this one year later, they announced that they're widening that had, through that entire area. Now, as a professional engineer, you don't ignore possible scenarios when you're writing reports. So either the, they um, did a cheap report, or they did the scenarios and didn't release them. The business case has a lot of scenarios that the details weren't released for. Now, stage two to here, and stage one to here, 
These were both designed by the contractor. Now, a lot of what was said tonight implied that RMS is doing the design. Uh, the contractors did the design for the other two stages, and it was done with the objective of achieving uh, bang for buck, as far as the state was concerned. But with only the contractors being the designers, there's always a risk as an engineer that you'll come up, um, that you'll see a solution that is not the cheapest possible solution. And some of those interchanges are certainly not uh, the most um, economical for the taxpayer. Um, you'll notice that we do parallel a lot of railway lines with these motorways. Uh, this is the Roselle kind of mess. I tried to draw the, the map here. I'm afraid you can't read it because it just is undrawable. Um, the latest map indicates that they will be staying on site the uh, Hawkesbury sandstone here and they'll be doing a single arch as stage three. Now this has been declared as a separate project from the Roselle Interchange. Now, one of the key questions that is raised by that statement by the Minister is stage three and stage uh, the Roselle Interchange now financially separate? Because the problem we face with this um, motorway, or the problem the government faces is, that it won't be a saleable product and that they're going to have trouble funding it. And this is where the Iron Cove Bridge link comes in. Now, if we go to the next slide. Um, uh, this is the old Metro Corridor, which is important um, later, but I'll tell you why. Uh, next one. Now, what they're talking about redoing is changing the alignment of the City West Link and Anzac Bridge. And from the documents released by, um, with some AE common lo uh, logos on it at previous community consultations, it looks like the um, West Connects will be prioritised to access Anzac Bridge. So if the West Connects is prioritised to access Anzac Bridge, and that includes from uh, Iron Cove, then it will basically encourage you to use this short distance-based toll section if you want to continue driving to the city. Now that would be, um, as an engineer, a very good way of generating uh, toll revenue. So now you've got a nice string of toll revenue. Um, we've got exits here into the uh, White Bay where there's um, a major development going ahead. Uh, this is a good way of uh, generating some demand into here. And for some reason, there's exits from the Western Harbour Tunnel into the Crescent, which would have to be widened to increase demand. Now, we do know that, well, we've heard that they're saying that they want to maintain some mass transit possibilities in the bay. This is the previous West Metro. So maybe, and we're hearing that they're talking about the West Metro again. So are they putting it in here? And this is one of the big questions we have because um, the community consultation in the previous session, previous stages was dreadful. The uh, M4 widening in EIS didn't include the 50,000 people now going into Olympic Park. Uh, it didn't include um, off ramps that have now been added. It didn't include the full impacts. And we have a very big risk uh, with the EIS process that goes out, and it has no legal teeth. So one of the concerns we have um, as the community is that if we wait for the EIS to go forward and we attempt a new legal action, there's not really much opportunity for us. Um, one of our big concerns uh, that I hear a lot from the community is how do we get our voices heard? And I think what we saw tonight was the best indication of why people power works. Because this motorway is the most expensive section in the state. Eight lanes of underground motorway, uh, for about 10 k's, is a lot of money. It comes out at $500 million a kilometre. And there is a very good chance that these um, one more. There's a very good chance that the 870 people per hour that they project on the, um, in peak hour on the stage two will not be enough to make it a financially attractive thing for the market. And we may risk that the 
whole thing is just kind of, um, well, actually, we have the, the, the good, uh, the good fortune of uh, seeing the whole thing um, fail to fi finance itself. Um, I'm going to. I'll just point out one more thing. <clears throat> there are windings on here, and there's talk previously of um, a tunnel under Dremoyne. That was the previous plan, and as Michelle said. Once they put a motorway to those sections, what you're now going from is four, uh, an iron curve will be going from four, five lanes to the bridge, which is uh, seven, eight, and now you'll be having ten lanes heading towards that. So then they start to go, well, now that five lanes is not enough for Japan. And what? Who's been to Paris? Right now, Paris is suffering an anti-cycling. It is a national emergency. They, their car pollution is so bad that you can't see the city. And it is such a national emergency that they're banning half the cars and they're contemplating banning the lot until the pollution clears. It's as bad as the London fog caused by the coal-fired power stations. Beijing is, a, is another example. And that's a city of 10 million people. What they did when they um, proposed all this is they assumed that the same proportion of people would drive into the future. And even though that they said it will take 19 minutes to get from um, Penrith to the CBD, but 50 minutes by train, they still assumed everyone would drive. So the numbers that this is based on are questionable. Finances that it is based on is um, interesting, and overall it's not going to work. But there is an opportunity for the community to uh, make their voices heard. Thank you.